Thank you for that song. Many times we wonder how we would respond to the greatness of God. Frequently, we find ourselves gasping or grasping for words until we're able to say, Lord, I just want to say thank you and I love you, Lord, for all that you did for me. for the life that you gave to me, for the hope, for the hope that you gave to me. You know, we are very blessed. We are very blessed because unlike other people in the world, we have a hope a hope that is not just anchored here on this earth, but a hope that will eventually bring us to heaven. Christian's hope 
Thank God for the Christian's hope. If it were not for that hope, I don't know what life would be on this earth. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the hope that you have given us in Jesus. Thank you because of this hope, even though in this life, on this earth, we face so many challenges, so many trials, temptations and all kinds of things that make life difficult. We thank you because of that hope. We thank you because we can look forward to that new heaven and new earth. Help us to continually bear the things that life here on earth offers. Help us to look unto Jesus. And as we study his words tonight, be with us, O Father. Fill us with your spirit and lead us to understand you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our study tonight is a consideration of the twin parables found in Luke chapter 14, verses 28 to 33. These parables are actually not difficult to understand. Some people, though, find it difficult. I think the difficulty lies in the way people fail time and again to re relate to what the twin parables ultimately demand of us totally today. Let's try to see what the twin parables of Jesus would have us do or decide to do. First of all, we have the parable of the tower in Luke 14, 28 to 30. Jesus said, For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. These twin parables actually depict actual life. And for all you know, these twin parables are parables of discipleship. The parable of the builder. This is a most practical parable, drawing us to consider the ultimate cost of constructing an edifice, lest we fail to finish the project. The second parable is of a similar nature, this time with regard to a king possibly confronting another king with twice the number of men that he has. But let's consider first the parable of the tower. This is a man intending to build a tower. And Jesus raised a most significant question about building an edifice. He asked, if you start constructing, would you know how to finish it? Or would you have the means to complete it? Let's analyze the question briefly, okay? Is the question reasonable? Is it therefore valid? Does it really matter? Most times we would answer yes to all of those questions. And when we answer yes, it is actually saying that we agree with Jesus. It is no use planning to put up a building or starting one, laying the foundation and unable to continue because either we run out of money 
or we underestimate the total cost, people will laugh at you, criticize you, mock you. You'll be discouraged. They will say, this man began to build and was not able to finish. I've seen many buildings constructed that way. Somebody began building and uh, before long, money was gone. No more money to build. And all you see is the skeleton. There is a joke going on around here in the Philippines that if you see a church that is unfinished, that is the Seventh-day Adventist church. No more. We're trying to do everything we can in the union, in our administration, to come up with finished buildings. And we're thankful to the Lord because He's helping us do that. The second parable, let's consider it. This second parable is about a king. What king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000 or else while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. Will a king still wage a war if he sees he is outnumbered? He has 10,000, 10,000 men, but his foe has 20,000. If you are that king with 10,000 men, how would you feel meeting another king who has 20,000? Jesus again raised a most significant question. He asks, if you wage a war, can you win it with so few soldiers? Can you finish it? Or will, would it finish you? Jesus ends this parable with the most sensible thing to do. Settle for peace. Settle for peace. Actually, there is something in these two parables that draws us into the, minds of, into the mind of Jesus. And curiously enough, Jesus concludes the twin parables with a challenge to discipleship. He says, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Let's go back to that first parable, okay? A man wanting to build a tower. Will he have enough to finish it? And the second parable, the king wanting to face another king. He's got only 10,000 men. The other king has 20,000. Will he be able to wage a war? Outnumbered. I was trying to see how these twin parables would work out in relation to the context of these two parables. What do these twin parables tell us? The main point, when you begin something, make sure you finish it. The main point? If you're thinking to follow Jesus as a disciple, be sure to go all the way. The main point, if you are thinking to follow Jesus, ask yourself if you are willing to give it all up. Let's go to the context of these twin parables we will notice that the context draws our attention to discipleship. In verse 25, we have a large crowd following Jesus. And as Jesus saw this large crowd, he turned to them 
and reminded them that if they want to come after him, they should be willing to let go of everything they have. Verse 28, there is a use of a particle for or gar to connect the previous verses with 28 to 33. And then in verse 33, Jesus used the word so likewise as a concluding remark that gives us an understanding that these twin parables do not stand by themselves. The parables call us to a life of discipleship. In the Bible, discipleship is very, very important. Discipleship is the only just response of an individual to what Jesus did for him. On hearing the truth about Jesus, most times we are so zealous and excited. We start out well. We follow Jesus zealously. We let the Spirit lead us. We promise to give all of ourselves. We get involved in church activities. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But that most often lasts only for some time. Soon, zealousness and excitement fade. And after a while, we lose the passion. We sort of cool off. We drift here and there. And before we know it, we are not disciples anymore, having lost our sense of affinity with Jesus. Look, if you want to be a disciple of Jesus, you have to make sure that your whole life will be lived out for Jesus. You cannot be a disciple now and tomorrow no longer. You cannot be a disciple now and next week. You are not a disciple anymore. There are only two things that we are looking at, brethren. Either we are disciples of Jesus every moment, each hour of the day, every day of our lives, or we are not disciples at all. And there is no middle ground. Either you are a disciple or you're not. There is a certain kind of radicalism in the way Jesus brings this idea of discipleship. Remember, the parable about the tower cautions us about building an edifice. Can we finish it? The second parable tells us if we cannot fight all the way, better settle or not fight at all. Is Jesus discouraging us from a life of discipleship by presenting these two parables? I don't think so. The Bible draws our attention to a life of constancy and consistency. And this is one of the most visible problems we have for many Adventists, for many Christians at that. We are disciples only for a while. Soon, our passion, our love for Jesus cools off. But... Discipleship is a lifelong commitment. It's not a momentary, on-off, transitory decision. We commit ourselves as disciples of Jesus on a lifetime basis. The kingdom of God beckons not just for this life only, but for eternity. If you want to enter into the kingdom of God, you have to be a consistent, constant Christian every day. Uh, 
I know of somebody whose Christianity is found only within the four walls of a church. Going out with the church is not a Christian anymore. Or you will hardly believe that person being a Christian. The twin parables of Luke, if we will analyze it, are parables that, are, that were taken in an Asian setting. And you know, in an Asian setting, a repetition of something signifies the real intention of doing what is being asked. This is one of the characteristic things that you'll find amongst Asians or Eastern people, let me say. They are fond of emphasizing things by saying things repeatedly. The twin calls for discipleship are twin insistence on our decision to follow Christ. The twin parables are twin insistence of our decision to follow Christ. Parables, you know, when you look at the parables, uh, they draw attention to the fleeting, fickle nature of human decision. And when you go to the very basic thing that the parable is saying, it is simply asking a question. Are you really decided on following me? This is what Jesus is asking all of us. You know, we want to enter into the glorious kingdom of God. We want to enter into the beauties of heaven, of the new earth. That glorious heaven, the new heaven and the new earth, did not come without a price. And the price for that is the life, the blood of Jesus. And because of this, Jesus wants to make sure that when we are going to accept him, when we want to become disciples of Jesus, he wants to make sure that we are really going to follow him. That's why in the Gospels, you'll find every now and then Jesus calling people, his disciples, to discipleship, real discipleship. The Gospels they elucidate the frequent emphasis on the kingdom of heaven. The Gospels clarify repeatedly the intent of both Jesus and the prospective inhabitants of the new heaven and the new earth. Why do you want to go to heaven? Why do you want to go to the new earth? Is it simply because you want, you want to get out of this earth? sinful place, dreadful place, full of sin, full of evil? Is that the only reason why you want to enter into the glories of heaven? We Adventists should know better. We realize that there is something more than just entering into the glories of heaven. What is involved here is actually God's character. When you accept Jesus, when you become a disciple of Jesus, and in your heart of hearts, you really follow Jesus, you are also saying to the world that, God, you are a just God. You are a good God. Every individual who accepts Jesus and follows Jesus on the way to discipleship is an individual who tells the world, Satan is a liar. Every individual who follows Jesus into the way of discipleship is an individual who upholds the justice, the mercy, the grace, the truth about God. Throughout the New Testament, True discipleship is expressed in different forms with the same emphasis. Same emphasis. One emphasis. 
and that is follow, follow Jesus. Question is, how do you follow Jesus? I mentioned to you already that throughout the New Testament, but I want to draw your attention to Revelation 14, 4, the middle part of that verse. That, that verse says, these are the ones who were not defiled with women for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from the, among men being first fruits to God. But I want you to go to the middle part of that verse. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. That one characteristic of discipleship. This one characteristics, characteristic of the followers of Jesus is something that we cannot just blink our eye on. If you are a disciple of Jesus, you are a follower of the Lamb. And if you are a follower of the Lamb, you will follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Jesus went all the way. He could have bargained with the Father. He could have told the Father, My Father, why are you spending so much time with these people? They don't deserve you. They've turned their backs on you. They've been traitors. But you love them. Why? Jesus could have asked those questions, but he did not. He said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And Jesus faced the ultimate penalty for sin, your sin, my sin. He went all the way. Paul draws our attention to that act of Jesus in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8. He said, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. So you see, if Jesus, our master, gave up everything for us, are we going to follow him and do less than what he did? I mean, you cannot die the death of Jesus. No way. But Jesus is asking us that we're not going to die. Jesus is asking us not to die. Because my death, even if I die, that will not atone for the life of my son or my wife or my neighbor. Obviously, to die the death of Jesus is something beyond us. He died for us so that we will not have to die. But simply, Jesus is saying, follow me all the way. Follow me all the way because I went all the way. Let me ask you this question. What are you? Well, I'm an Adventist. Well, I am a student. Well, I am a professor. No, that's not what I mean. What are you? Are you a disciple of Jesus willing to go all the way like your master? Or you're just somebody? 
in the Bible. And I, can ex I cannot expound more on this. It's either you are a disciple of Jesus or just somebody, or not. Heaven, wonderful heaven, beautiful heaven, glorious heaven, the glorious kingdom of heaven to be realized soon. This is a place for the disciples of Jesus. This is not a place for a person who is a disciple now and tomorrow is not. You have to be a disciple of Jesus all the way, every day of your life, every hour, every moment you breathe. You must decide for yourself to be a disciple of Jesus. Here is an advice. Here is an advice from a concerned pastor. Let's make our Christian life, our discipleship life, continually on fire for Jesus. Many people who were supposed to be Christians did not become Christians simply because the Christians they found around them are Christians who were not living the Christian life. Gandhi went to London one time shortly before India obtained its independence. And he was considering very much what kind of religion would the people of India have. So he went to London. Of course, he has other things to do. He had other things to do in London, but in, my, in his mind, he was always thinking, what type of belief would my people accept? Would my people have? He went to a hotel in London. Unfortunately, he was roomed with somebody who was supposed to be a Christian. He was exposed to somebody who was a Christian. That Christian was cursing every time he would come into the room. He would drown himself by drinking everything that he could lay his hands on. He was throwing glass all over, bottles all over. He was making life very, very difficult for Gandhi. Before long, Gandhi made a decision. I don't want my people to be Christians. You're wondering why India today is not Christian? Go, go back to the time when Gandhi was roomed with somebody who was supposed to be a Christian. He was not a Christian. Maybe one time he was a Christian, but he forgot how to be a Christian, or he went back to the ways of the world. You cannot do that if you're a Christian. If you're a disciple of Jesus, you have to stick to Jesus all the way, and you have to be constant and consistent in your discipleship life. Our situation today, we may have committed lapses. We may have drifted here and there. We may have lost our zeal, but really, all is not lost. We may be down, but not out. We can rise up to a new life in Jesus. In Jesus, we can still recover. In Jesus, we can renew our commitment. And when we begin again to live with renewed dedication and commitment, let's keep things that way. I know how difficult it is for many to remain focused on Jesus. This life just, sometimes I'm short of words to des describe what kind of life we have here on earth. 
It's a very difficult life. So many trials, so many temptations, so many problems, so many concerns. If not for Jesus, if not for the hope that Jesus gave to us, probably most of us would have taken our lives away. Many people who took their lives were people who lost their hope. We're thankful to Jesus. Tonight, I want you to look at my Jesus. My Jesus loves you. My Jesus wants you to enter into the glories of the kingdom. My Jesus wants you to turn your back on your failures. My Jesus wants you to turn your back on the things that bother you. Because in Jesus, in my Jesus, you have the certainty of entering into the gloriousness of that kingdom. You just have one thing to do, and that is commit your life to the Lord. And when you do that, stay committed to the Lord. Let's keep things that way. Let's keep things that way. Let's stay that way until Jesus comes. Tonight, as we close, I'd like to ask you to bow your heads and pray with me. Father, in a very, very special way, I pray for a special group of people in this campus. The professors, the teachers, the lecturers. I pray for them that you will help them. So as they lead the students of this institution, they may draw out from your words truths, teachings, tenets, gems that focus on discipleship, that focus on following a life of renewed commitment. Oh, Father, to be a professor, to be a teacher, is not easy. There is great responsibility for knowing so many things. But I pray that more than anything, Father, bless our professors here so that in their hands they can lead the students to a better understanding of, you want, of what you want your professors to do. Give the students an idea, an understanding of what it means to be a true disciple of Jesus. Many of these students will go back to their own places. It's very important that they realize that more than mental acquisition, more than intellectual progress, they may acquire an understanding of what Jesus did for us to obtain salvation. Oh, Father, please be with us. Bless not just the professors, teachers, lecturers. Bless each one of us, all of us tonight. Help us to live a life of discipleship, true discipleship. Help us to be willing to give up everything for Jesus because this is what you want us to do. 
Lead us, O Father, and bless us. Help us to be your disciples, the kind of disciples you want us to be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.